I'm Vincent Racaniello. Over the past 11 years, while doing research on viruses at Columbia University, I've recorded almost a thousand podcasts in the fields of microbiology, virology, parasitology, evolution, and immunology. From this experience, I have learned that the conversation is a great tool for communicating and teaching. And the great part is that you don't need any slides. Talking without slides makes people be clearer about they, what they want to convey to you. And so tonight, it's my plan to have a conversation with these three individuals who have done amazing things to advance uh, human health through innovative collaborations. And you've heard Michelle introduce them. Uh, let me put uh, the names with faces uh, far away from me there from the Burroughs Welcome Fund. Victoria McGovern, welcome. Thank you. Uh, next to her from the University of California, Berkeley, Dan Portnoy. Thank you. Welcome. And on my left from Weill Cornell Medical College, Carl Nathan, welcome. I didn't like the way you said immunology, but I understand. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> I got it. Immunology, immunology, how's that? So what I wanna do first is explore a little bit of uh, the training of these individuals, because I find that that's instructive to see how they've developed in their careers and always interesting uh, things emerge. So let's start with uh, you, Carl. I wanna know first where you're from. New York City. Can tell, right? Yeah. Where, and you went to high school in New York as well? No, in the suburbs. Um, actually, my first two years were in a building that's now a dorm for your medical school. Columbia. Yeah. So you grew up on the upper uh, Fort Washington, uh, what mm -hmm. is it called? Washington Heights. Yes. Where there was once a battle in the Revolutionary That's War. That's right. Okay. And uh, where did you go to college? Harvard. Okay. And were you a science major at Harvard? I was an East Asian history major and um, got interested also in South Asian history and got a Fulbright to go teach English in India, but there was a war. Mm -hmm. And my draft board said, if you go, uh, I mean, if you go to India, uh, you won't get there because you're going to be in Vietnam medical school. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. It's an, you know, it's an example of how, you know, you look back on your career and try to make a story that there was some um, purposive path that Man, you can rationalize, but actually it's a matter of adapting to the things you can't control. Right. <laughs> I've, I've spoken with a number of individuals who were literature majors. Harold Varmus, for example, yeah. was a literature major at Yale and ended up winning a Nobel Prize in science. So you never know. So you went to medical school out of necessity essentially. Yeah, I loved it, but I, I, I had never, nobody in my family had ever done anything like that, and I didn't mm -hmm. think I could either, but there I was, and it was terrific. And when you finished, what did you do next? Well, um, another uh, decision was influenced in this case by death. So actually, the, the evening that I received notice of being accepted to medical school, my mother had died of cancer, so I had made a decision if I um, that I would go into oncology. So that's what I did. Mm -hmm. And so did you, you never actually practiced medicine? Did you do a residency? Uh, well, I, I did residency and fellowship training. Mm -hmm. And then um, the next decision uh, was influenced, I'd have to say, looking back by insubordination. <laughs> so um, I was at a, a program that received, there were four oncology fellows and each of them was supported by funding from a different outlying hospital. And I was assigned to this hospital. And about two days after I got there, the, there was one oncologist on staff and he, he just couldn't stand it anymore. He pulled the station wagon up to the side door and put his desk stuff in it and drove away and he was gone. So I thought it wasn't appropriate uh, to leave an untrained fellow in charge of these very sick people. And I wrote a letter to the program chair and said, bring them to the medical center or send a board certified oncologist. And I was put on probation and told, disappear, go into a lab. We don't want to see you anymore or we'll kick you out of the program. So I joined the lab and began the same work I'm doing now. So I forgot so to it's ask another, you. another ricochet into a career. Yeah. I forgot to ask you where you went to medical school. 
Uh, Harvard also. It was Harvard as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you stayed on at Harvard. And what lab did you go into? Well, the, the lab I'm referring to now is that of Richard Root at Yale, mm -hmm. uh, who was the head of ID, wonderful mentor. And that's another thing that shapes careers, of course, is mentorship. That's the question I have here. How important were the mentors in your career? <laughs> totally important. Yeah. yeah. Um, they, it, it makes such a difference uh, who, who you have the privilege of meeting, whether they're interested in, in uh, young people and mentorship. So actually, I began in research without ever thinking it would be a career, um, starting in ninth grade, the summer after ninth grade. And this was actually a rejection. I, I wanted to be a construction worker. I had this image of myself then. It's gone now, totally gone. And uh, the company said, yes, I could. But I showed up at the first day, and they said no. So I didn't have any alternate plans. Uh, so my parents had a friend uh, who had uh, actually a wonderful humanist who had just gotten his DPhil from uh, working with uh, Sir Howard Florey at Oxford. And he opened a new lab at NYU. And I went and worked there, and I went over and over again. He was very interested in mentorship. So he had chalk talks given to us by Lewis Thomas, Baruch Bernassaraf, Jonathan Orr, Chandler Stetson, Sherwood Lawrence, and it was extraordinary. How do you recover from that? Of course, I had to go into research. Mm. So is it safe to say that you, you haven't touched a patient? Oh, no, I was, I was heavily involved with patients, but uh, there, it was so, it was very meaningful, and I, I gave that up with great regret. But it, oncology is a field where it's, you may spend a day or more uh, preparing your cells for an experiment, and your beeper goes off, and that's your responsibility. Got it. And it's very meaningful and rewarding, but hmm. I had to go. Uh, some people can do it, and I admire them, but I had to pick one or the other. So you, you never did a formal postdoc, right? I should have done, but never did. Never did. You just got your experience working in laboratories. Yeah. And when did you go to Cornell? Uh, that was 1985. Um, I, I was at Yale, and I was supposed to stay on and, and be clinically active. But as I say, I decided to switch. Right. And I went to Rockefeller for nine years and then to Cornell. OK. So we'll get back to your science. But Dan, you're actually the, the one person of the three who I'd met before many years ago. So I know a little bit about you. Where are you from? Well, I was born in Syracuse, New York. Ah. You really didn't know that. I didn't know that. And then um, moved to Southern California when I was six and grew up in uh, the San Gabriel Valley. Mm -hmm. And went to high school there? High school there. And then I went to college um, at UCLA. And I was a bacteriology major. It was the last year of the bacteriology major. They, in fact, as many know, this was the American Society of Bacteriology. Mm. And then, we, we changed, the year I left, it became um, Department of Microbiology and has other names since, but yeah, UCLA. Is there anyone in the audience that you were taught by back then? No. I'm a, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I think not. <laughs> but I did have some um, amazing teachers. So you went, to, you went to college with the idea of doing science. Oh, I wasn't sure. It was, I wasn't sure. I, um, I was interested in psychology, and then when I took, I forgot exactly how it happened, but I, when I took what was then Bacteriology 101, basic microbacteriology from June Lascelles, who had been a PhD student of Krebs, the Krebs cycle, mm -hmm. and the textbook was The Microbial World, and so many people who've more of a certain age were influenced by this <laughs> book, the Roger Stanier, who actually was at Berkeley and wrote this amazing microbiology textbook that changed everything. And so I took this class and I don't really, really yeah, I fell in love <laughs> um, with bacteria. Right. Where did you, at what point in college did you say you wanted to get a PhD? Do you remember? Right. So I was still thinking about other routes, possibly med school. Vietnam War was over. Mm. Um, and the summer after my junior year, I worked in the lab of Sid Rittenberg, mm -hmm. a, a, microbi a great microbiologist. And that summer, I had my first taste of data and just the excitement of it um, and decided I wanted to, um, other way, yeah, go to grad school. And as it turns out, my PhD mentor gave a seminar that year 
Stan Falco, and they were saying, it was early, and this was 1976 or seven, and cloning was new, and they were saying, the cloner is coming, the cloner is coming. It was Stanley Falco, and I go to his seminar, and I guess there was some cloning, it was mostly about diarrhea. Um, and he was really funny and really engaging, and I, and I decided I was gonna go to the University of Washington, where he was, and I did get my PhD with uh, Stan Falco. Okay, and then postdoc was where? Uh, yeah, so after time working in bacteria, I, I, for the PhD, and as I said, I, I was in love, but I, I needed, I felt I needed to learn more about the host, and I went to, was in many ways then, and perhaps still now, I'm not sure, is macrophage mecca, was at the Rockefeller, where it was a whole department devoted to macrophages and dendritic cells. Mm -hmm. Ralph Steinman, who ended up winning the Nobel Prize for dendritic cells, was a assistant or associate professor at the time. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, everyone worked on macrophages, and I did too. So I left bacteria for three years with the idea that I'd work on the two of them together, mm -hmm. is what I did. Okay, and then your first faculty position? Um, I went to Wash U in St. Louis for two years, mm -hmm. and um, ended up moving after two years to Penn, where I was for nine years before moving to Berkeley. Berkeley. So where was it that I met you? I don't remember. Now. At Stanford, so I didn't mention that. So Stanley Falco, um, after my th it was after my third year of grad school, he accepted chairmanship of the microbiology and immunology department at Stanford. And we moved from Seattle to Stanford, and okay. Stanley went to this new beautiful space, and Stanley had three positions he wanted to fill, um, a, virolo a virologist, a parasitologist, an immunologist, and, and you interviewed for the virology position. So that's, I met you as a student then? I was a grad student. Okay, okay. And, and you, I remember your seminar, it was like it was yesterday. Okay, but then afterwards, we met at various meetings. We used to go to the same meetings. Yeah, right? after my, I, after I went to Penn and I had a few discoveries and this was starting to be invited to meetings, the same thing, your career had taken off already and mine started to take off. And so we ended up at these meetings that involved, you know, that were pathogenesis meetings. Was, that's right, that's right, they were. And I remember you said once about uh, Listeria, it, it won't kill you, but you wish you were dead. That's a famous line from you, right? No, that's, a, that's Shigella. <laughs> that, that's <Come> the... <laughs> okay. It's a long time ago. But um, St Stanley said that, and Sansonetti was always at those meetings too, so who knows where this came from. But uh, <laughs> we, yeah, I remember there was, we were at a few meetings together, right? Well, this one in, in Switzerland. Yeah, that's right. Where I, I thought you'd said that. We actually roomed together. Right. And I remember Dan because he just kept talking all night. <laughs> and wouldn't go to sleep. It was mm -hmm. one or two a.m. So it was really animated. You were very excited and uh, energetic. It was great. And so now, I haven't seen you for over 20 years, so it's good to see you. For, you. for you, how important were the mentors in your career? Very important. I, I, I had many, but there's three that come to mind. And with me, it starts with my father, who was a virologist, an MD and a virologist, and hmm. he was very supportive. And I think the idea that starting early is important. So I did actually do experiments with bacteria and other things when, as a young child, I, um, influenced by my father. And then um, I had a professor who taught bacterial pathogenesis, Ralph Martinez at UCLA, who was very supportive and we became very close friends for 40 years. Hmm. And he just passed away last year. And then um, my PhD mentor, of course, Stanley Falco, um, who also passed away last year. Um, yeah. Okay, Victoria, where are you from? I'm from Tampa, Florida. Wow. I wouldn't have guessed either. Really? No, I can't tell <laughs> accents at all. No. Well, that's what Floridians do. We have <laughs> neutral accents. And you grew up, went to high school there? I, went, I grew up and I went to an all-girls high school there. I, correct, I collect other women who went to all girls schools because it's an unusual thing in the United States. So if any of you out there are, are like me in that respect, please get in touch. I love hearing about uh, what, this, uh, what the impact of this was on people. Mm -hmm. My school really excelled in, in training people for math. And the reason for that was so many girls were meant to get married and go become the accountants in the companies that they, uh, they married into. And so uh, a lot of us are very math-oriented and very science-oriented. And where did you go to college? I went to Wash U. Hmm. And the reason I went to Wash U is that by the end of high school, I knew I wanted to study infectious diseases. 
And being a Floridian, I also don't want to be cold. So uh, there's, there's a line there and the snow comes to it and I try to avoid that line. But uh, I really thought that WashU was going to be a place where I could do pretty much whatever I wanted. And by that I mean, it seemed when, when I was considering universities that uh, they were pretty unformed. You know, you had the ability to create your own major, you had the ability to go work in the medical school, or you had the ability to cross over into engineering. And I knew I wanted to do things that were creative, and I knew I didn't know how to do them. And it seemed to me that if you were in a place where you were allowed to cross barriers, that you could pretty much write your own ticket. And I don't think I understood when I was 17 what that meant for, mm. <laughs> for the next four years. And, and I certainly didn't, uh, didn't write my own ticket, but I did have a great experience there. Did, where did this interest in infectious diseases come from? Well, one of the cool things about being from Central Florida, you know, every place has its own history. And uh, my hometown got wiped out by infectious diseases over and over again. And finally, after the Civil War, made a good stand of, of becoming a little town. And then yellow fever came on and wiped out everybody. Mm. So there's a yellow fever cemetery in the middle of Tampa. And mm. I had been to it a lot. And the idea when I was a you know, probably middle school and early high school, that something could happen that would wipe out everybody in your hometown made a big impression on me. And uh, I, when I was a kid, I loved walking to the library because it was something I could do that wouldn't get me in any trouble. Mom would say, well, where are you going? I'm going to the library, Mom. And she, she always believed me. And I pretty much mostly went there because I was a good kid. And, and I would just sit there and read about infectious diseases. And, uh, Whatever. <laughs> I, uh, I, I really fell in love, I, I think, in high school with the viruses. And, and the reason for that was that there was some reference book there that showed, you know, the sort of early 1980s version of everything you knew about every virus anybody knew anything about. And I think I could have become an engineer if I hadn't gone into science, mm. because it seemed to me that the viruses, you knew what the working parts were and that if you knew what the working parts were, you could start thinking about what they were for, and you could start to understand this phenomenon that could wipe out the entire community. And I, I just couldn't imagine anything else that I would want to think about if I was going to think hard about anything. So at what point in, in college did you start thinking about PhD? Probably, I, I think just like, just like most people who go to uh, college, I had no idea what the PhD business was like. And I was lucky that my sister decided to become a PhD. Yeah. Um, she's a cognitive psychologist. And I think the things that she was curious about, it was the obvious next step. So she was never one of those people who wanted to be your therapist, but, uh, but was somebody who needed research labs. And because of her, I, I discovered that life-changing thing that I'm sure most people here who are graduate students or postdocs uh, were astonished by too, which is that you don't pay to go to graduate school, that somebody else would take care of that. And for me, that was, that was a big change. I had assumed you would finish your bachelor's degree and go out and work. And if you were lucky, you could get a job where your employer would send you on for more. So, uh, so hearing that somebody else would pay for that really made me very much oriented in the direction of heading that way. And where'd you go? So I ended up, well, I worked for Bill Goldman for two years at WashU, mm. and they gave me very good advice in, in Bill's lab, but it kept snowing on me after I heard this advice. What is this? Why? And so, so I looked only in the Southeast, which is where I'm most comfortable and most happy, and I went to the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Mm -hmm. So around the time that I went to WashU was when Roy Curtis's lab was there. And I rode a lot of times on the shuttle between the medical school and the undergrad campus with people who would come with uh, Roy from Birmingham to, to St. Louis. And they really sold me a lot. And when I went and did my interview there, I, I think I had never seen a place so beautiful. And the people who were there were just terrific. This was, you know, Gail Castle was there, whole group of uh, virologists, Max Cooper's lab. And, uh, and it was, just felt like a great atmosphere. It was my first interview, and all of the other interviews had to, uh, had to battle them off the, uh, the top of the hill, and, and that's the place I stayed and loved. What did you do after that? So after, after that, I, made, I make a series of strange choices in my life. I finished graduate school during the great funding trough of the early 1990s, 
and the postdoc I had always planned to do fell through because there was no money to take me into the lab. And I decided that um, I, I was just trying to figure out what to do next. I was reading lots and lots of papers, trying to figure it out. And there was this one pile of paper I was reading because they were so much fun, and then the rest were the things I should do. Eventually, I decided I had to do what was the most fun, and I made one of those, uh, one of those decisions that's going to make everyone here go, what? And I went to the, the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. The thing that got my attention, when I was a graduate student, I worked on chromosome structure and bacteria, which is a real step away from my, my laser focus on infectious diseases, but it was the coolest thing. You know, when I was rotating, it was the coolest thing. And I was curious uh, when I was reading these papers that drove my postdoc choice, because uh, this guy there, Jim Oliver, who some of you may know, had been working on something called the viable but non-culturable phenomenon. And I thought when I was reading those papers that what I was seeing was a different, a different type of sporulation. I didn't think it was sporulation, but I thought it was going to be a developmental pathway that would be as robust and interesting and exciting as sporulation. And I thought, I have to go there. And I know I need to go to some place more famous after this, but I need to pick up this system because if this works out, this is going to you know, blow the doors off. I'm, I'm going to have... I'm going to have everything in front of me, and nobody else knows this is here. So that story, any of you who follow it, it's still up in the air what VBNC is. And uh, during my postdoc, I decided that um, I guess at some point, pipetting in the middle of the night, I decided that I wasn't going to go on for the second fabulous uh, postdoc that I would have uh, needed to put me into a great position for being hired as faculty. And I moved on. Have you, did you immediately go to the, the Wellcome Foundation? Or? No, no. I actually, I, I really only have two skills in life. Um, one is I'm, I'm good at writing. Mm -hmm. So in college, I was an English major and a biology major. And uh, I just lucked out. You know, the same time frame that had the NIH trough also had the beginning of thinking about career development for young scientists and what we were going to do with all these postdocs who were getting stuck and not moving into jobs. So uh, kind of out of selfish interest, I got into workforce things and griping formally about what was going on with hiring. And because of that, I got an opportunity to write for Science's Next Wave, which was the first of the professional society's attempts to start doing programming for young scientists. And I had tried working as a freelance writer before that started. And I got little local things, but nothing you could ever build a future on. And once I had AAAS science on my, on my writing resume, everybody wanted to hire me. So when I was finishing up as a postdoc, because the uh, World Wide Web started coming along, I was suddenly making more money as a writer than I was as a postdoc. And I thought, you know, this is a sign from the universe. I can go do something else. So I became a science writer for a while. And uh, the science writer job at the Burroughs Welcome Fund came open. And I went and I, I tried to persuade him that I was the most hireable writer in the universe. And somehow they didn't believe that, and they hired somebody else. And I, I was a little devastated because I, I really thought it was a great fit. But they hired me as a freelancer after that. Mm -hmm. And when this job, running the infectious diseases program, came up, I, I pretty much um, followed the around like a puppy. Please take me. Please take me. You need me. I'm the one you need. Don't think about any other candidate. And uh, I, I don't know, eventually I smoothed them and they, um, mm. and they took me. I want to come back to you and talk about funding and, and such, but let's go back to Carl now. And uh, the theme that I like is that you have done basic science and, now, and as you say on your website, now and then sometimes clinical trials. Mm. Where, where did that interest to do both come from? Was that a product of being an MD and, and, and doing science, do you think? I think the MD side of it provided an opportunity more than a motive. I think the motive was to test ideas as rigorously as possible. Mm -hmm. And um, gosh, this was so long ago I, when I discovered interferon gamma was surprisingly macrophage activating factor. And then the question is, that's with cells in vitro, is it true in people? One person could write an IND. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I did. I didn't need 10 lawyers and you know, the rest of the team. And um, I injected tiny amounts of interferon gamma into people with leprosy, of, of whom there were at least 400 known registered in New York City at the time. 
and uh, biopsied the skin and saw the bacteria disappear. And then later I did a trial where I biopsied the other side of the patient and the bacteria disappeared. It was really, uh, you know, an extraordinary way to test an idea. And once you had that good result, then you kept going back and doing yeah, it. Yeah, how does it work? Yeah. You know, what are the pathways that are induced? And, you know, one thing leads to another. Now, a theme throughout your career is macrophages, mm. right? You're interested in how they work, how they kill, and so forth. Where did that interest come from? Well, it, it came from, again, this is another uh, benefit, I guess, uh, unintended of, of the medical training, uh, watching inflammatory lesions of different kinds in people destroy different kinds of tissue, you know, a rheumatoid arthritis joint. That's, people talk about the macrophages, but actually it's full of neutrophils. They just get washed out when people make slides. Mm -hmm. um, a liver abscess, a brain abscess, you name it. Um, and I, you know, I had this interest in tumor immunology, which at the time was very primitive. It was on the order of injecting turpentine into lesions. You know, it was just, um, it was, mm. it was so primitive. Well, okay. So um, I thought this is an enormous power uh, that evolved in the setting of infectious disease. And if we could figure it out, we could bring it back to tumor immunology. So actually my career is an enormous detour. From what? From what? From an interest on tumor immunology <laughs> off into host pathogen interactions with the idea of coming back to right. cancer. So one of the major areas of macrophage biology is nitric oxide that you mm. have. Did you discover this initially? Because you have this paper, identification of nitric, uh, sorry, nitric oxide, a macrophage product responsible for cytostasis and a respiratory inhibition in tumor target cells. That is 1989. Yeah. Uh, was well, that, was there, that... there were, it, it, a lot of people discovered a lot at the same time. There was tremendous mm -hmm. ferment in the field. So I'd actually give John Hibbs credit for the observation that there was an arginine dependent pathway that macrophages used to kill tumor cells, but it, the, the pathway was unclear. Um, and we were, uh, we simultaneously with Marletta discovered a cofactor tetrahydrobiopterin that the enzyme needs and that plus some uh, guesswork about other cofactors allowed the purification techniques that everybody used for NOS1, NOS2, and mm -hmm. NOS3. So yeah, we cloned, we purified NOS2 simultaneously with others, cloned it simultaneously with others. I got to name it iNOS, and I want to take credit for iPod, iPad, <laughs> IT regs, it goes on and on. This was the first one. You can't have iPod though, no. All right. <laughs> but you would like to have it, I'm sure. Yeah. And, and then, um, 1997, you find nitric oxide synthase uh, protects against tuberculosis. So where does the interest in TB come from? Well, partly it, it comes from the phenotype of the knockout mouse being so dramatic for TB. I see. Um, and partly it was the, I mean, I was just so ignorant about TB. It was actually Lee Riley, now at Berkeley, who was then at Cornell, who taught me to pay attention to the disease. And I gradually realized that it's not only an enormous medical problem, but it's one of an elite group of pathogens that doesn't naturally uh, fulfill its life cycle in any other species than human. And it's been with us, people think, at least 70,000 years. It's still here. We're still here. So that speaks of an equilibrium. So I thought there are two ways to learn how the immune system works. One is to read, read how it feels to the pathogen that mm -hmm. lives with it. And the other is to study its failures. Do we know if there are any polymorphisms in uh, INOS genes that affect susceptibility to, to TB? The, uh, well, in, in mice, we engineer that. Yes, in in human, evil. the first discovery of uh, human INOS deficiency is uh, in review. And uh, I'm a collaborator, but the work really is Scott Drutman's work mm -hmm. in the lab okay. with Jean Laurent Casanova. So I shouldn't say more now, but it's exciting. So it is a good question then. Yeah. Okay, very good. <laughs> you've, also, <laughs> you've also been interested in inhibitors of TB, right? Drugs? Uh, yeah, so um, the, I got into thinking about antibiotics uh, in, in a number of ways. So first of all, it actually goes back to INOS. 
Mm. So the work with, I, uh, with INOS, I, I went to Merck and uh, asked them, this would be around 89, mm. to help support a program. And they did, with, there was no money exchange, but they, they began a remarkable scientific collaboration, sort of an academic collaboration. And they pretended that the, what eventually were 60 people at Merck and three or four people in my lab were mm -hmm. comparable teams. They actually exchanged visits. Um, and the, the head of uh, immunology and inflammation gave his spare bedroom to my graduate student to stay at Rahway, and he gave him the key to a 250-liter fermenter building. And Genentech gave us mouse interferon gamma, and he, the student came back with a, a, a so almost cantaloupe-sized cell pellet Mm -hmm. We had one chromatographic workstation, so my friends at Merck told me to rent a pickup truck and show up at the back lot, <laughs> and I did. He distracted the guard, and I came in. We loaded the truck up with chromatographic workstations and drove back to New York and took shifts. And after we purified the protein, I rented the truck again, and we put the stuff back at Merck. It was so much fun. It was just great. I like that story. Yeah, That's and great. so we cloned it. Um, so anyway, this, this was an unforgettable experience, the thrill of an academic industrial collaboration that's not based on money, but on a shared goal. It taught me something else about drug companies, because on one Friday it was 60 people at Merck, and the next Monday it was zero working on this project, because mm. the business people decided it wasn't clear what the disease indication would be. Mm. But what, I just had such admiration for their skill. Was that your first industry co cooperation? Uh, it was the second, but it was the first that uh, there was no intellectual property discussion, no, no written agreements, no mm -hmm. money, just fun. And um, it also, uh, the, as I began to learn about inhibitors and, and disease and antibiotics, I learned that antibiotics actually were the origins of the field of chemical biology. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know if people would agree with that, but I think the idea there's a specific biochemical molecule that does something because it hits a specific target came out of understanding how antibiotics work. Mm -hmm. And then I learned that antibiotics were also the origin of the pharmaceutical industry because it was in World War II that this, the penicillin project, um, uh, basically the government recruited chemistry companies to work on this. It was so profitable they turned into drug companies, many of them. It was the origin of NIH. Uh, the, the people who ran the penicillin project uh, demonstrated the power of government to fund diverse researchers for me medical good, for public good, and those same individuals, individual became the first director of NIH. Mm -hmm. So I, I really, uh, then I reflected, so this, you asked me where I started and I told you about where I was a baby. Actually, in my first year, I got pneumonia and was taken to your hospital, and the nurse told me I got penicillin. So I was in the first wave of post-World War II civilians or, uh, for whom penicillin was available, because it had been a military project. Mm -hmm. right. And the nurse told my mother if I'd come a year earlier, I would have been dead. So I'm... I'm not that old, uh, but it's a typical lifespan later. You know, I was there for the advent of accessibility to antibiotics. Now I feel like I'm here for the Disappearance Act. So I, <laughs> it, that's just a blink, a blink. And I, I can't, I, I can't uh, rest with that idea. So I've gotten very interested in taking this model of academic industrial collaboration and trying to apply it to mm -hmm. antibiotic development. So you wrote this very interesting paper, Cooperative Development of Antimicrobials, and you point out some of the old uh, cooperations and the new ones. Tell us yeah. a little bit about that. Well, there, there are a couple of experiments. I think they all work. Uh, they're all different, and I, I think it tells us there, that a diversity of approaches is very wise when the problem is this mm -hmm. complicated. Um, one of them that's really cool is called the Trace Cantos Open Lab Foundation. So it's a charity. It's headquartered in England, and applicants uh, can be from anywhere. They're typically from academia, but occasionally from other from companies. And there's a board that reviews projects for innovation mm -hmm. and reviews whether the home institution of the applicant agrees uh, for so-called global access provisions. So this is actually hard for a university whose name I mentioned earlier in answer to your question to, to accept. I, I won't say it again because 
one and added to. But um, so the, the people come and uh, live inside a campus of GlaxoSmithKline. It's called, the campus itself is called Diseases of the Developing World. So there you partner with uh, a scientist or a scientist whose time is donated as in-kind contribution. You have access to everything in the company, the whole compound set, uh, all the resources. Mm -hmm. And um, if there's a product, it's jointly owned, but the goal is it would be made available to people in need at affordable prices or free, if that's what that means. And it's, been, it's had 76 projects in the last nine years. Um, a TB drug is moving into clinical trial that came out. Of, I mean, the, the efficiency of having the discovery scientists and the drug development scientists side by side working together rather than sequentially, mm, it's mm. remarkable. And, it's, and you learn so much at the same time. So that's one. Another one is, uh, was uh, ginned up by the Gates Foundation. It's called the TB Drug Accelerator. And it's a consortium of drug companies and academics. Mm -hmm. The academics serve both as developers of the technology the drug developers wish they had already, but who can wait, and as uh, screening centers. And uh, that actually began also about 10 years ago. It was formalized in 2012. And it's been remarkably successful. Again, this uh, different paradigm, enormous efficiency. So the, 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 you know, the secret sauce is breaking down the secrecy barriers and sharing together. Mm. And then a third example is local. It's a not-for-profit early stage drug development corporation that was put together and owned by Rockefeller University, Memorial Sloan Kettering, and Weill Cornell. And it uh, partners with a drug company, Takeda, but the IP stays in the institution. And uh, it's the same thing, working side by side rather than through a legal chicken wire fence or at a, at a geographic distance. Hmm. So I'm a believer. I think all these things uh, work. And I, uh, I don't know how many had the privilege of hearing Jean-Pierre Picard's talk earlier in this meeting about the uh, Global Antimicrobial Research and Development Partnership, a, a not-for-profit, a fantastic idea. And of course, uh, the day before he spoke, the New England Journal carried an article by Nielsen's and Spellberg and colleagues calling for not-for-profit for, -for, -profit for um, antimicrobial development. I think those are really good ideas. So what, what advice would, would you have for a PhD scientist, say, who, who wants to do a balance like you did to do fundamental research and some clinical applications? What can they do? Well, I, I, th the, I, I was... Uh, at the fireside chat today, I was discouraging an MD PhD student from picking a project whose success would be, I made a new drug. 99% yeah. um, failure rate, and if he succeeded, he'd be an old man, and his name would be submerged <laughs> in a list of 50 authors of people mm -hmm. who uh, contributed more, you know, to the end game, uh, so importantly. But I think there's enormous potential uh, to look at antibiotic development in academia as chemical biology, to discover new enzymes, new pathways, new ways that cells work, how they yeah. communicate, yeah. compete. Now, Dan, you have, again, spent a career doing fundamental research on listeria, and more recently have turned to clinical applications. So let's, let's provide the foundation. What, what attracted you to listeria many years ago? Right. So, as I said, I, I was interested in looking at the interface of pathogens and, and host cells and looking just globally at what the important pathogens were or where we had least, um, we, didn't, you know, we lacked vaccines or therapeutics such as tuberculosis. They're all intracellular pathogens. And the, so, so I, I was interested in intracellular pathogens. And then while at Rockefeller, I became to appreciate that listeria was a really nice model in the mouse for studying basic aspects of immunology where immunity to listeria was entirely antibody independent, requires cytotoxic T cells. And, and so in and listeria, so there was a nice mouse model. Intracellular pathogens were important, are important, and listeria is easy to work on. Mm -hmm. So you can grow it in the lab, it infects cells and grows very rapidly. There's, that, you know, saying there's a mouse model, et cetera. So it was uh, just seemed like a nice system to, to try in my own lab. Okay, so over the years you've studied aspects of how 
the, the bacteria moves into and through cells, right? Yeah, so I just started and, my, and predicted, because it was, I realized this from the natural history, that's an oral pathogen, and based on the way the field was going, it should be invading cells. Mm -hmm. So in my own lab, I just infected cells, I looked at the microscope, and it was obvious they were not only growing, but they were spreading from cell to cell. And, and I saw that it was just really within the first week of working on it. Mm. Um, and yeah, I have a career, I thought. <laughs> um, yeah, so then I, yeah, I started thinking about you know, the mechanisms, et cetera. And it, it ended up, as you probably know, it was the bugs were harnessing the active polymerization of the host cell to propel themselves within a cell and then out of a cell and into another cell. Right, and there's this paper from 1989 with Tilney and Portnoy, uh, actin filaments in the movement of listeria in cells. And I would say that's a seminal paper, right? T showing how the yeah. bacterium's moving around. It was, a, it was a nice collaboration with Lou Tilney, who was, a, well, he was younger then than I am now, but at the time, I was a new assistant professor then at Penn, and I met him, and, and we started this collaboration. It was basically electron microscopy. I would infect cells, walk down the, you know, up to the biology building, and um, they would look in the microscope, and that's what it was. And we, it was, it was you, what you, what you see is what you get, in that story. So over the years, you, you would di dissect the genetics of this. It wasn't just us. I mean, there was a, there was Others. other labs as well. It was actually it became very competitive, and very fun. Mm -hmm. The cell biology community also got many, you know, very interested because we ended up learning a lot about basic aspects of actin. You're right. and, and it turned out um, eventually we, one of the things we were looking for was how um, actin is nucleated and eventually Matt Welsh at Berkeley with purified act A that we provided was able to show that act A would activate what he discovered as the ARP23 complex and using, he had discovered it using Listeria. So that was a fun little time. So now fast forward to last year. Recombinant Listeria promotes tumor rejection by CD8 cells. How did we get there? <laughs> so to, right when I started working on Listeria, it became obvious that the bacteria entered um, the cytosol of the cell. They break out, they, they produce a pore forming toxin called LLO. They break out of a vacuole. They grow in the cytosol where the actin is. Um, and I started giving seminars, and immunologists would look at the basic cell biology that we described, and it was obvious that the bacteria were in the cytosol might be useful as vaccines, mm -hmm. because they, they entered into the, what is known as the MHC class one um, pathway of antigen processing presentation. And it's true, the bugs secrete proteins in the cytosol, and they get chopped up and presented. And you develop. In fact, Listeria is excellent at inducing these CDAT cells. Um, and in the, early in my career, I think it was '87, uh, I read an article from David Baltimore. Wasn't that where you did your postdoc? Yes. In Baltimore, it was HIV was being recognized, and he and he made an appeal to the scientific community to start thinking about how we might contribute to dealing with with AIDS. And I thought, oh my gosh, I, I need to turn the steer into a vaccine for AIDS. <laughs> okay. And that was the idea then. And then I moved to Penn and collaborated with Yvonne Patterson, and we eventually, in 94, published a paper showing that if we cloned a foreign antigen, we used influenza nuclear NP, and it had Listeria express and secrete it, mm -hmm. that in the, student, in, the, in the mouse would raise a CD8 response. Mm -hmm. And then others thought, Actually, it was Drew Pardall and um, Yvonne Patterson who first came up with the idea that this could be used for a cancer vaccine. Because as I think we're all starting to realize, immunity to cancer and to intracellular pathogens have some things in common. In both cases, you have to recognize the infected cell. Um, and so for a variety of reasons, basically economic, I would say, there was a lot more interest in using Listeria for cancer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. than for infectious disease. And so I, saw, I didn't want to develop a vaccine in my own lab, but eventually I moved to Berkeley and a, there was a company that was thinking about using Listeria for cancer vaccine and they contacted me. And so I started working with them and that became a 15 year relationship. Um, the company had changed names a few times and um, became a Duro Biotech. And that led to actually making attenuated strains of Listeria that were still immunogenic. 
Um, it's interesting, we ended up using the strain lacking the gene necessary for actin polymerization, the acta mutant. That strain gets into the cytosol and grows, but is attenuated because it can't spread and is a really good immunogen um, it, when expressing foreign antigen. And so with, this led to coming up with some potential cancers that we might treat, some antigens that were overly expressed in tumor cells and eventually mm -hmm. clinical trials, phase one, phase two. That's about where we are. So the, the listeria is lacking the actin nucleation gene, which you discovered years earlier, I presume? Yeah. And you weren't thinking about vaccines? I was done with, act I, uh, I was <laughs> done with actin <laughs> at that point. And the other gene that's deleted is? Uh, oh, was it, was it called internalin B? It's, a, it's involved in invading hepatocytes. And so at least in the mouse model, presumably in humans, it's less toxic, less liver damage. Okay. But the real attenuating mutation that's critical is the actin mutation. All right, so these, this strain, which you call LAD, I think, right? Mm -hmm. L-A-D-D. Then you put antigens in it. You put tumor antigens in it. Yeah. Where do you get those from? Well, in this case, um, the collaborators we had, uh, Drew Perdahl and Liz, um, uh -huh. Liz Jaffe at um, Johns Hopkins, convinced us of an antigen. It was called mesothelin. Okay. So it's um, present on a number of tumors, including pancreatic, small, small cell lung, ovarian, and mesothelioma. And so we engineered listeria to express and secrete human mesothelin. And so you've said these have now gone into phase two? Yeah, we, we two? inject, um, or they inject. I, I'm not involved with those directly there for, for sure, but um, 10 to the ninth of the bacteria intravenously mm -hmm. um, into uh, very sick humans. What, what kind of cancers? Pan mostly pancreatic. Other studies have gone, but there's been hundreds of, we've, many hundreds of pancreatic. Mm -hmm. Patients. And these are individuals who we treat who have a life expectancy of about three months. So it's, 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 a, it's, it's a high bar to treat these patients. And what's, what effect do you, do you see? Um, I can't go, I don't have the time to go into all the details of the vaccine, but it, it, there's certainly an extension of life. In, yeah. in the study that was most exciting, it was like five months, which, which is significant. And do you, do you look for CD8? Cells that recognize the tumor yeah. antigen and yeah. they're that reduced did. and so forth. Yeah, it's not, yeah it's, not, it's not the mouse. <laughs> <laughs> the yeah. mouse, we can get 10% of our CD8 specific for pretty much any antigen. It's pretty remarkable and we can clear tumors very well. Yeah. It's, and it, <laughs> and um, these, uh, do these bacteria actually home to the tumor? No, not at all. It's purely immunotherapy. In yeah, this yeah. case, there are vaccines. Um, in other, where the, 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 the pathogen does go to the tumor. In this case, it probably is just is, is entering, going to the liver and sp yeah. spleen yeah. And, 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 and inducing immunity. So it's purely a, a way of inducing immunity to the tumor antigen, um, right? Is this gonna go to phase three? Not, um, in fact, there was a, there, there's a licensed vaccine that another company, um, Advaxis, has, uh, for, that is now, I, I believe it's licensed for dog cancer. Mm -hmm. so, so that went to, in dogs, and in, in humans, they're getting ready for an ovarian trial, I believe. Um, Aduro has pretty much, well, where, where, they, where they are, where they were, was personalized medicine, where they would act, mm -hmm. where they would take a tumor and sequence it and find a, an, what are called neoantigens, and we would build yeah. a strain of listeria expressing ten to twenty epitopes mm -hmm. from this mm -hmm. patient, and that, that's promising, much more expensive. Um, but mostly, Aduro has dropped the listeria program for another uh, avenue. Okay, so this is not being pursued. Well, it's being pursued. I, I mean, other other places. It sounds promising to me. Yeah. Not just for cancers, though. I mean, yeah, it is early. promising. There, there, there is some reluctance in the pharmaceutical industry and in elsewhere to use a live yeah. bacterium still. Small molecules are preferred. Yeah, sure. But in the phase one, there were no serious adverse effects, I presume? Yeah. It's been very safe. There's been a couple, a couple of patients where the, the bugs have grown extracellularly at a port or in an implant. And, and we have ways of, of, actually we're in the lab right now, we have a few ideas for engineering bugs that, can only, that cannot live extracellularly mm. to deal with that problem. Mm. So you say that people prefer a small molecule, but as you know, people are experimenting with bacteria that home to tumors and deliver drugs, right? Mm -hmm. And if that works, you have to go with it, right? Well, I, I, I agree. This um, probiotic E. coli is being used 
for those experiments and mm -hmm. you can deliver drugs and they penetrate tumors. So you might want to revisit the listeria. So this whole clinical bent, you didn't anticipate this when you started years Certainly ago. Certainly not cancer. Yeah, maybe vaccines? Yeah, uh, I, I'm still interested in vaccines for infectious disease. So far, the, the vaccine is administered intravenously. Yeah. And so we have, and there's not a lot of, as much support for that kind of research. So for the most part, your lab is still doing fundamental? Fundamental. Listeria mainly? Mm -hmm. Um, exclusively. Okay. So this is an interesting contrast. We have an accidental clinician for a short time, and then we have mm -hmm. you who actively seeks from, from fundamental to clinical application. Mm -hmm. And both are, are fine, right? Well, <laughs> you invited us. <laughs> well, I didn't know what you were going to say, of course. <laughs> no, but the, the point is, if you you stumble onto things as Dan yeah. has, and, and you yeah. go with them. And Dan has obviously a, a deep interest in fundamental issues, but, and, and you continue to mix the two. Right? Yeah. Right. Let's talk to Victoria about money. It's always a good topic. <laughs> so you, you oversee uh, investigators in the pathogenesis of infectious disease program of the fund. And so what does that do? Tell us about it. Well, so the program in pathogenesis is focused on the conversation between host and pathogens. And this program was launched at the first big strategic planning after we gained our endowment. We used to be the corporate foundation of the Burroughs Welcome Drug Company. And after a hostile takeover from Glaxo, mm -hmm. uh, we were given an endowment by the Welcome Trust and told to go on our way. And uh, it took us a few years to, to get underway. And when we held our 2000 strategic uh, strategic plan, we said, how can we get some great bang for our buck? Up until that time, we had been investing in tropical diseases where the communities really needed building. And we wanted to try something that would be uh, sort of a higher impact activity that would still take care of the tropical diseases and fungal pathogens, but would also have room for immunology and, well, that was already a piece of the others, but, uh, but you know, have the virology and the bacteriology together. and. We wanted to be thinking about where, where, was, where was the point of all of this research? And the real point in the end is what goes on in the human host. And if we could understand uh, the, the relationship, what goes right and what goes wrong when you encounter a microbe, then we could really start to understand how to manipulate those things and how to, how to be in the business of wellness instead of in the business of disease. So one of the great benefits of my job is that we, we as an organization get to talk to lots of people. That's what happens when you have a large pile of money sitting next to you. <laughs> and so we've always had great advice. And at the time that we were putting together the pathogenesis program, one of the people that we got to spend a lot of time talking to was Josh Letterberg. And this was around the time that he wrote his paper on ending the war metaphor. I'm moving away from the us versus them and how do we wipe out as many of them as possible and start really thinking about what it was to be a, a super organism. Mm -hmm. What is it we're doing? And I, I think that thinking really um, helped open the cultural door to all of the microbiome work that's going to be driving all of us for the next few decades. So I think we wanted to build a program that was going to anticipate that and that was gonna be able to keep looking down the road in terms of where infectious disease research was going and bringing in the right talent to keep answering questions that we couldn't even imagined mm -hmm. uh, when we started thinking about it. So right now we're in the middle of, or the beginning of another round of strategic planning. And when people ask me, where are we going? I, I don't know when we're going there, but I can't imagine a, a future where in five or 10 years, this meeting isn't gonna have a whole lot more macroecologists, a whole lot more people who think about the movement of people, the movement of animals, and are talking much more with basic, basic bench scientists, especially people who work in infectious diseases. Uh, we are going to have a bigger and bigger universe in our hands as microbiologists. And the only way we're going to understand the big picture of infectious diseases is going to be to understand vectors and understand reservoirs and understand what difference deforestation makes on where the deer and the mice meet when, uh, when Lyme disease is at foot. So I, I think 
what we try to do is stay a little bit ahead of the science, and the way we do that is by talking to the smartest folks we can. So if any of you are smart people who aren't talking to us, and I, I think there's a room full of them, one of the things to know about uh, funders is that we are all about you, and we seek advice from the community, but we can't know everybody. And so getting in touch with us when you have great ideas, partly by submitting them in grants and partly by just walking up to us and say, saying, here, here's an idea, think about it, uh, is the only way we can ever learn anything. So people can email you and say, hey, I have this idea, would this be compatible with what you're interested in? Yeah, yeah they, they can always ask us that formally. But I, I think one thing people don't know about program officers and program officers and people who run grant programs is that we spend all of our time thinking about grant programs. Mm. So often, if you ask me about something that's not what we do, that isn't within the sort of spectrum of, of where our pathogenesis uh, program currently funds, I may not be able to, to point you at anything that's going to do you any good at Burroughs Welcome, but I should be able to point you at other things that are good out there. So talking to your funders, this is also true of really uh, active NIH program officers, although often they are so busy that they don't have time to talk to you that way. But for those of us who are at um, smaller private funders, this is what we do. We, we are all about talking to the community and hearing from you where the funding gaps are, um, not just to fund what's the next project on your, on your bench, but to fund the projects that need to be funded so that your communities can move ahead. So I, I suppose you come to meetings like this to find these people that's and talk right. to them, that's, right? That's why we're here. Okay, so who can apply at what career stage, any stage? So the, the pathogenesis program, which is our only focused infectious disease program, is aimed at assistant professors. Mm -hmm. It only funds people who haven't been promoted to associate professor, whether that comes with tenure or not. The reason that we're aiming there is that we think that people who are postdocs have a lot of potential. We have several postdoc programs that aren't totally infectious mm -hmm. disease programs. Uh, but we think by the time you're a midterm assistant professor, you've pretty much shown what you can do. The people who are not going to be the big drivers of their field are slowly beginning to show that themselves. And the people who are going to have more ideas than they have hands for and more ideas than they have large federal grants for are also starting to differentiate. And I think in the PATH program, the, the tough thing is really looking at people's work and, and seeing what, what they're aiming for, not what are they doing today, but what's their vision and where's mm -hmm. that going to take them is, is the, the tough task that our advisory committee has to sort out every year. How do you know if your money is well spent? Well, I think we ask ourselves that a lot. <laughs> And, uh, and it, it's been a tough thing. You know, there haven't been great metrics other than they're writing papers, they're turning mm. out great people. So for a long time, it's been, you know, you know it when you see it, that somebody who's successful, both of these guys are incredibly successful people, and you can judge it by not only the impact of their papers and the arc of their careers, but also from the great people that they've trained. But that's a, a long-term view, and I think we're, we're all hoping analytics and better data about mm. uh, what careers look like every five years and every two years is going to be helpful for forecasting who's going to be a big winner. So Victoria's written an article, which I highly recommend. It's called Getting Grants. It's in a journal called Virulence and uh, has a lot of good tips for uh, what you should look beyond the NIH. That's one of your main messages, right? That's right. So please, please send us grants. Yeah, there I you think, go. Send them in. I think I, I may have revealed in that paper, and if not, I'll, I'll tell you the secret in a very large room full of people. Don't tell anybody else, though. And that is when there are private programs, when there are private funders who launch new programs, generally people ignore the first year, which means whenever you see something mm. new, you might as well jump on it if you time to try to grant, it's entirely possible they're going to get 30 applications instead of the 2,000 applications you, you think are going to be out there for anything. You get many applications every year? It's one, one time of funding per year? We, we fund once a year and, again, only assistant professors, yeah. and we get about 150 people applying a year. How many grants do you give out? We give, our, our funding rate is about 8%, so anywhere from 10 to 12. Okay. And uh, that's a discouraging number, but I think there are lots of discouraging numbers yes, in science. Sure, sure. It shouldn't stop anyone. 
All right, let me, let me end by asking each of you a couple of questions. And uh, Carl, I, I think I know the answer, but I'll ask you, and if you hadn't become a scientist, what would you have done? Well, I'm still trying to become a writer. So uh, uh, I, I think that'd be- Be a writer? Answer. Yeah. But not journal articles. You're not talking about that, right? Um, well, I've had um, poetry and um, fiction rejected by good journals, <laughs> along with science articles. <laughs> All right, that's your, yeah. that's your so literature. The, the rejection right. is evenly spread over okay. different genres. All right, Dan, what about you? Um, psychotherapist. Psychotherapist. Uh, can, you, can we talk? <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to, but okay. don't touch me. <laughs> I, was, I was kidding. <laughs> so any reason uh, for that? Well, I was, that was when I was choosing a career, I was thinking of going, uh, becoming a psychiatrist because I was thinking of med school and I didn't really want to go to med school, but I thought and I worked in a mental hospital for a summer and got it. It was interesting. And then now it's because I just really like talking. It's really I, talking to undergrads mostly at Berkeley. I really enjoy the one-on-one -on -one interaction. Yeah. And uh, that's what I would, I stopped thinking of still doing it. Thanks. Okay. Mm -hmm. Victoria? Well, if I had to start all over again, I think I would end up with, a, with being a scientist. I can't imagine any way you could toss my dice that wouldn't have ended up with me saying, hmm. I just want to know more. All right. Hmm. Carl, if, uh, what, what do you think is your most significant contribution to the field? The training students. Okay. You like that. Dan? I think it's the areas where I got people outside of microbiology interested in micro. And so the mm. discovery of actin excited the cell biologists. And more recently, we didn't, didn't talk about it, but the, it is today, but discovery of cyclic DIAMP and listeria as a immune activator, uh, again, connects the microbiology to the immunology and cancer. So the, those two would be my, okay. like my biggest discoveries. Victoria. And I think developing a cross-field community of people who think about pathogenesis. You can't argue with that. All right, my last question. If you could dine with anyone, living or dead, who would it be, Carl? To, to dine with? To eat dinner with, yes. Michelle Barak. Oh, that's great. That would be I, good. I said that like you, you, you made it one person, so I had to. No, that's perfect. That's very good. <laughs> Dan? Oh, that's, that's all. Hmm. Um, it would be with my father. Your father? Yeah, he, he is the one person who really understands the work and the life, and, and it would be just wonderful to have. I still have occasionally, he comes back home back in my dreams, and I love that. And so if I could have a meal with him, um, hmm. maybe even a couple of drinks, <laughs> <laughs> I'd be very happy. All right, Victoria. Well, earlier today at TWIV, the answer that somebody came back to you was, uh, was dining with Trudy Ellian, and that was something I got to do a lot when I started at the oh. fund. But my answer is Ben Franklin. Mm-hmm. Did you go fly a kite with him? Uh, the original self-educated <laughs> uh, self American yeah, model. That would be very interesting. Yeah, yeah. That, that kind of person is... How about you? Who would I like to... Uh, I think uh, Albert Einstein would be really interesting to talk to and tell them about viruses and bacteria and what we can do, genomics and uh, making people healthy and live until their old, old age. I think that would be a lot of fun, Albert Einstein. I mean, there are lots, lots of people out there, but uh, that's mine. And this is what I'd like to do on, on my podcast. So if you enjoyed this conversation, we have more. You might be interested in our podcast. You can find them at asm.org slash podcasts. So they are Several of them are sponsored by ASM. We have This Week in Microbiology, This Week in Virology, This Week in Parasitism, etc. Uh, I want to thank my guests today from the Burroughs Welcome Fund, Victoria McGovern. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. From the University of California at Berkeley, Dan Portnoy. Thank you so much. And my neighbor in New York City while, from Wild Cornell Medical, Carl Nathan. Thank you. Who I have not met until tonight, so yeah. that's the way it is. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. 
I want to thank ASM President Michelle Swanson for arranging this forum and ASM for their support. Thanks for listening, everyone. Good night.